ready? I'm ready. Are you ready, Freddy? Look at the view outside today. It is nice, clear, blue skies. Not a cloud to be seen. Nice day up ahead of us, I think. A little cold, but not too cold. But I think it's going to be a nice spring day for a lot of us. And hopefully for you too. All right. Let's get things started. Seven past the hour here in New York. It's 39 degrees outside coming to you live from Queens, New York. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hi. It's your boy, Renee, up in the hizzy. What is going on, everybody? Live on the Monday morning. Here. Coming at ya. Happy Monday, y'all. Hope you all had a wonderful weekend. Hope you had some time to rest, relax. Do what you wanted to do. Uh, there was a lot of interesting things to watch this past weekend because there's a lot of what I like to call it was a full blown retro throwback weekend because you had a new Ghostbusters film in theaters. You had X Men 97 up there on Disney Plus. And then you had Roadhouse, a remake of the original Roadhouse movie from back in the day all coming and culminating into one weekend. I did a poll up on the channel asking people, oh, what are, what are, you, what are you planning to watch with all of this retro stuff from the week in, during the weekend? And of course, no surprise that obviously uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire was the top choice. But a lot of people were like, you know what? I'm going to watch X-Men 97. Or you know what? I'm going to watch Roadhouse. Or you know what? I'm going to watch all of them. But surprisingly enough, and to my to my delight, a lot of people are saying, nah, F all that. I'm going to watch Late Night with the Devil. So I'm glad that a lot of people were planning to watch that this past weekend. What's going on, Star-Lord, in the house? Bright and early on this Monday. What's going on, dude? Hope you're doing good. Hope you had a great weekend. But yeah, I found that extremely fascinating. That a lot of people really wanted to watch Late Night with the Devil. And I thought that was cool. I thought that was really, really good. And I hope they enjoyed it. Well, we'll look at the poll later on today. Um, maybe we'll go through some comments. From there were a lot of comments left on some of my my videos this past weekend, and you know I already talked about Ghostbusters on Friday. I already talked about X Men ninety seven last weekend, uh, last week I should say, on Wednesday, and this this over the weekend since I already watched all that stuff, I decide uh, to watch Roadhouse. So I will talk about Roadhouse later on in the, in the morning and give you my thoughts and feelings about all that. Starlord saying, Roadhouse! So I will talk about that for sure. Obviously, we're going to talk box office numbers, box office weekends, and some upcoming predictions for this upcoming weekend. Talk about that. Talk about some headlines. Several news bits that happened in the past couple of days that I do want to touch on and address and kind of just look at and all. So we'll do all that good stuff. We'll have a fun morning, fun, chilled, laid back type of morning. By the way, it, it's rare for, for me to feel like this during the morning. But this morning, as I was preparing, waking up, you know, making my coffee and stuff like that, I felt hungry. And I rarely feel hungry in the morning. So over the weekend, I did some grocery shopping. 
and I came across this new product. Or maybe it's not new, but it's new to me. And it's called Sausage Pancake or pan what is it? Sausage, no, pancake, sausage pancake wrap something. It's from, it's a Jimmy Dean product. And, and I, and I prepared it today for myself. I know it looks like a penis, but it's not. But it is sausage on a stick wrapped in pancake batter in dough. Never seen this before. I love trying unique stuff and new things. It smells like a pancake. It has like that maple syrupy kind of smell to it. And uh, anything on sticks, I usually tend to love. Corn dogs. Um, what else? Uh, takoyaki. Shish kebabs. I, I love anything on sticks. So I decided to heat this up. And I'm going to try it right here for the first time in front of everyone. We'll do a little ASMR, a little mukbang for you for this early morning on a Monday. So here I am. Wow. Holy hell. This is pretty damn good. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. This is pretty damn good. I know for a fact it's not good for you. I didn't even bother to take a look at the cal the calorie count on this. But this is this is damn good. I wish I kind of had um, a side of uh, maybe maple syrup dip. Dip this sucker in there to get some more syrup on it. But man. This 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 tastes pretty damn good. Mmm, yummy. Oh, it's delicious. What the hell was that beep? Mmm. <laughs> Started saying, make it stop. My bad. <laughs> well, that is good. I was not expecting it to be that good, but... Holy cow. That is one tasty treat. I have no idea what that beep was. I'm, I'm like looking at everything right now. I, I, I guess everyone heard it who's, who's watching live right now. Uh, I'm looking at the windows that I have open. Maybe it's the ASMR police. They're like, stop it. Can't take, can't take any more of this mukbang. This morning mukbang. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. If it happens again, I mean, we'll see what happens. But yeah, have no idea. Oh, well, the show must go on. So let's go. Um, how was everyone's weekend? What did everyone get up to? For myself, like I like I mentioned, did some grocery shopping, did some chores, watched Roadhouse. Played some hell divers with my boys. Nothing too crazy, honestly, this over the weekend. Uh, I was reminded again, unfortunately. Hmm. Sorry, I can't get enough of it. It's so good. I was reminded again that. One of my local theaters is closing down. Um, not the one that I go to every week. That's 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 fine. It's a theater that I haven't been to since I was probably in my mid twenties, mid to late twenties. Um, I have to drive to get there, but it's not that far. Maybe without traffic, it's like a good 10, 15 minutes. But it's been there for a very long time. It's part of this uh, square, triangle square. I think that's what they call it. But on one side is a party city. And there used to be like an office max 
if you remember those back in the day. And there you, there was a Toys R Us. So you had shopping on one end, and then on the other side is the movie theater. So I remember when I used to go there when I was younger, it would be like a full-on uh, outing for me. It would be like, go to Toys R Us, hang out, check out what's there, check out what's good with either the, in the action figure aisle or in the video game section or in the movie section because I remember Toys R Us had a lot of good deals on movies, especially like animated movies on DVDs. And then it would be go watch a movie. Or sometimes it's the opposite. Watch a movie first, then hang out at the Toys R Us. Now, of course, here in New York and in the rest of the U.S., you know, Toys R Us eventually filed for bankruptcy. They closed up all their stores. They're back, sort of, because you could, you could find them now at Macy's, certain Macy's across the nation, and at airports. At some airports across across the U.S., so they're they're slowly making a comeback. And in New Jersey, they're actually they actually have a physical store at the American Dream Mall or something like that. The the, the mall in Jersey that has like a indoor amusement park that has a lot of Nickelodeon themed rides and and everything. So they have that going on there. But obviously, you know, with Toys R Us closing up shop that whole area is pretty much deserted except for people who want to go to party city to pick up party stuff and then you know they have the movie theater but that movie theater it was called uh or it is still called whitestone cinemas they're closing down in may uh and i i first caught wind of it in january and then i was reminded again that that it's closing down because on my way to Target, uh, I you drive by it all the time because they have like the big sign that you could see from the uh, from the interstate there, and they always have like the advertisements on the big video monitor on the big video screen as to what the new releases are. And I took and I looked at it. I was like, oh yeah, these guys are closing soon. You know, so it's a little sad, a part of childhood, you know, leaving, which sucks. So it's like that whole area now is like gone or is going to be gone. And again, like I said, that was like a, a, a very, that was a place I used to frequent all the time. Um, anytime a new movie was out, I used to go there, especially when I was with uh, an ex of mine way back. That would be our, our movie theater of choice because, again, you could make an outing out of it. And it's not that far from like some nice places to eat and all. But uh, I remember watching. What did I watch? Oh my god, you name it. I and I watched it there. It's like, especially like between, um, I would say two thousand three, or maybe like two thousand one to two thousand eight. Like all the movies that came out around those times. Like I was there. I usually watched it at that theater. The first Fast and Furious I saw there. And I remember, you know, there were like, anytime it was like a big major blockbuster, though, there would be like lines all over just to get in to watch the movie. And I remember when Fast and Furious came out, you had a lot of those guys that pretended to be street racers. And they would like talk about, oh, yeah, they did this one thing. And I remember when I tried to do that back in the day, and blah, 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 blah. You had a lot of gearheads that were there because not that far from the theater is, well, now it's called City Field, but you have Shea Stadium where the Mets play. And around those areas are a lot of auto body shops, mostly illegitimate fronts. That's a New York thing. We won't talk about it. But if you know, you know. And obviously, a lot of those gearheads that used to work in those areas or used to go to those areas and hang out there went to watch the movie because th there wasn't really ever a movie about street racing, especially like a Hollywood blockbuster type movie. 
So I remember that was a huge deal for a lot of these guys. And they all converged into the lobby area, which was massive. There was like a massive waiting lobby type area that was also next to all the concessions. And I remember after the, the move, like each screening, they people would converge and just like hang around, right? If it was like early afternoon on a weekday, usually they'll hang around and then they'll try to sneak into another movie. Well, the security was very lax in that place. You know, it is what it is. But I remember just hearing their conversations. I was kind of laughing, you know, as they, they're all like trying to pretend to be the, like these street racers and all. But I saw so many movies there, and man, it, it was just it, it was such a, a fun period, especially for 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 cinema, because you saw crowds like you don't see anymore, except if it's like a big major movie event like Barbenheimer. Um, you know, so I I, I miss those eras, like I miss those days, because it was like a it was like a big social event. To go to the movies on a weekend. Like, even if there wasn't any really big movies out, you still had crowds of people watching movies. And you really don't get that anymore at all, whatsoever. You know, it's definitely a time gone, gone. You know, so it, it's it's a close of a chapter in my in my history, in my memory. And it's unfortunate, and I'm sure a lot of you have those experiences where something local or something you used to go to as a kid, when that place goes away, you're like, oh man, you know, like I remember this, I remember that. So I'm going to do, and I haven't been there in probably over 20 years. I haven't been back to that theater because, you know, I, I've found other theaters that are closer to me and are, you know, easier to go to. Um, because I don't have to deal with like, the theater I go to. I don't necessarily have to deal with like the traffic on the highway. So, but I'm going to do my best to visit that theater one, one more time. Like one more time after, uh, one more time before it, it, it closes for good. You know, and maybe I'll, I'll do a special video of it. I'll, I'll record the insides and, and all that. Yeah, and I'll talk about some of my memories. I'll show the abandoned Toys R Us that's still there. They still have the sign and everything. They didn't even bother uh, to take it down. And no one's ever wanted to rent that space again because I'm sure it's pretty damn expensive. So, you know, I'll, I'll probably do a special tribute video to that, wh who, which I'm sure the locals in my neighborhood in Queens will really appreciate. You know, so, yeah, so it was just one of those reminders I had over the weekend. Uh, Star Lord, my weekend was good. I was stoked every time I left the movie theater, always impressed with what I just saw. But then I grew up. <laughs> well, you also said, like, I remember you told me before that you, you haven't been back to the theater in a very long time, right? I think it was Dragon Ball Evolution, the last movie you saw in the theater. Um. But yeah, I know what you what you mean. I know that feeling. I, I especially when you go to the, the movies with a bunch of your friends, and when the movie's over, you have like these conversations about it, about what you just watched, maybe some of your speculations, right? You dissect the movie with your with your with your boys or with your group of friends. Yeah, you know, especially if it's like a nerdy movie or a science fiction movie. Uh, don't bring up my PTSD. My bad. <laughs> you blew it! <laughs> my bad. Um, but yeah, like I, I miss those days because, I, you know, a lot of my friends live a little farther from me now. Blake doesn't live that far from me, but our schedules are usually so different. And plus, he lives in the city and I live in the outer, in the outer borough. So we don't get to see movies together as often as we used to, like when we both worked in the city. Um, but most of my, my, my friends now live out in the burbs. So it's, it's rare for us to get together and watch a movie. I think the last time I watched a movie with a group of friends was probably Avengers Endgame. 
And we actually made an outing out, out of it. We had, um, what did we do? We, we did like a nerd weekend. We rented an Airbnb in the city. And we, we brought our games and all that. And we played all through the night leading into the next day where we had tickets to watch Avengers Endgame. We watched the movie, packed house, obviously. And then we ate somewhere uh, for brunch and we just had a nerd out session talking about the movie and everything. And it was just so much fun. It was such a lot of fun. You know, so I, I miss those days. I do. Uh, and, you know, hopefully I'll have days like that again in the future. You know, it's again, it's like when you get older, everyone has different schedules. You know, a lot of my friends have their own families now. So it, it's rare to get those moments. You know, but I, that's why, you know, I cherish the moments from the past. And I remember there were a lot of moments at that theater, uh, Whitestone, that I, I remember and I, and I cherish in my memory. I can't bring up a lot of them right now. Maybe it's a little bit too early and I haven't had much coffee yet. But yeah, that again, that theater, like, I guarantee you the mo moment I get in there, I'm going to remember so many things. Like, oh, I'll, I remember standing in line there for this movie, you know, blah, blah, blah here. I got into f my fight and into a fight with the next here. <laughs> I'm sure all of those things are going to be brought up for sure. Uh, I remember the walk I would do. You know, when the movie was done to go around the building to go to Toys R Us. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Like, I love memories like that. So, yeah. So, such is life. Things move on and we carry on, right? All right, I'm going to finish this damn sausage pancake. Mm. Oh, it's so tasty. Mmm. <laughs> it's crazy how something like that can taste so good. Oh, and it goes so good with your coffee. Oh, man, I am in heaven right now. Whoa. Let's talk about box office. I'm ready. Hit the music. Box office time. Breaking down. Box office from the past weekend. Yet you Ghostbusters, you have Doom. Kung Fu Panda 4. Immaculate. Late Night with the Devil. Who reigns supreme? Check it out, check it out. Let's go. All right. So. Dragon. Dragon, dragon. Dragon Ball Z. I don't know if you're referring to that, but. <laughs> um, I had to let that out. Sorry. I... I <laughs> I don't even know what you're referring to, though. Or maybe I do. Oh, wait. Do I? I, I don't know. I, I'm still waking up. I'm sure you'll, you'll remind me. But yeah. So, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire came out. And my prediction last week that it was going to do like around 30 to 35 million. But I know the predictions from other sources were saying 40 to 45. So it made 45.2. You know, so good job on Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I'm I'm actually a little surprised that it got that much love over the weekend. But I'm glad it did. You know, and I really do hope and it, like this no matter what I feel about the movie, I hope those who saw it were entertained. I hope they enjoyed it. Um but Ghostbusters Frozen Empire came out on top with 45.2 million. And I think globally, it's around six, yeah, 61.6 million. I, I think, I don't know if that's a franchise best, but according to this article here, 
with the opening weekend, the Ghostbusters franchise as a whole finally is in the Billion Dollar Club. When you collect all the movies together, finally the franchise itself can say it's made a billion dollars at the box office. So you can you can recap here. In 84, that movie brought in almost $300 million in total. The sequel, Ghostbusters 2 in 89, brought in $215.5 million. 2016's Ghostbusters Answer the Call brought in $229 million. And 2021's Ghostbusters Afterlife brought in $204.3 million. You notice how they always like hover around or above the $200 million mark? I think that's really interesting, but also it's interesting to note how nothing has ever come close to the original Ghostbusters as far as box office dollars is concerned. So Ghostbusters, their Frozen Empire, did really well for itself. However, it's going to have a very tough road ahead of itself, especially with this week. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Star-Lord had to let out, sorry you do, you made me do it. I'm about to go roadhouse here and slap myself silly. <laughs> I can't wait to talk about Roadhouse too. That was a very interesting movie. Um, coming in at number two, we had Dune Part 2. Pulling in 17.6 million. Domestically, now at 233 million. Globally... 574.3, but I believe after today, it may cross over the $600 million mark. So it's inching its way to a billion, but I still don't think it's going to make it. I think it's going to sh you know, fall short, maybe falling around 900. I keep saying that week over week, but I still stand strong by that. Kung Fu Panda 4 came in third with 16.8 million, 133 million domestically, globally. 267.9, and I think that's going to go up even higher after today. So really good stuff. That franchise will continue going strong each iteration that it's putting out there. Immaculate, the new horror film starring Sidney Sweeney by Neon, or distributed by Neon, I should say, pulled into 5.3 million. Um, I believe, if I am correct, uh, this is one of Neon's most popular horror movies that came out in theaters. So I, I, I don't quote me on that, but I think I read a headline that said that. Uh, I'll, I'm actually going to try and plan to check that out this week. By the way, this week, you know what else is coming out? Uh, Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey Part 2. And I'm so tempted to watch it, but I never watched the first one. And... I don't know. I don't feel like punishing myself at the theater. I don't want to be sitting through something that's a piece of shit. So I'm probably not going to do it. But I will say that when I saw that on the schedule for this week, I was like, ooh, just very briefly. And I quickly changed my mind. Um, in fifth place, you have Arthur the King. That's that Wahlberg dog movie from Lionsgate. You have It came in uh, with 4.3 million, 14.6 domestically overall. The other new movie that came out, Late Night with the Devil with David Desmalchen, 2.8 million. So for a small film like that, which I believe had a very tiny budget, I don't I don't know exactly what the number is right now off the top of my head, but I'm pretty happy it did that. And it sounds like a lot of people are definitely um, supporting this film regardless of the AI controversy, which I think is horseshit anyway. Uh, imaginary, other horror film. You know, March has become another pocket for horror films i've noticed uh, very interesting that it turned out that way so it's another horror film out there from lionsgate 2.8 million coming in seventh 23.6 overall domestically a24's love lies bleeding that's a christian stewart lesbian revenge thriller 1.5 million 5.6 million overall cabrini from hope and faith-based studio, Angel Studios, 1.4 million, 16.1 overall domestically. Bob Marley, One Love, still in the top 10, coming in 10th with 1.1 million, despite that it's already available on demand for viewing at home. And also to note, Disney has re-released Luca 
in theaters. Or actually, I shouldn't say re-release. Luca is in theaters, I think, for the very first time because before it was released only on Disney+. Plus. So you had that kind of outside of the um the, the outside of the the 10 the top 10 there only five hundred and fifty thousand dollars but i wasn't expecting that to do much another one that went more nationwide is uh, a24's problemista pulling in shy under five hundred thousand. it's a very small independent movie but i do like it and i do recommend people checking it out so with all that being said Ghostbusters reigning the t the box of at the moment, but Godzilla Kong comes out this weekend, and I'm predicting Godzilla Kong is probably going to pull in around sixty million dollars this weekend. I I foresee Ghostbusters Frozen Empire having a drop off of maybe sixty percent, if not higher, in box office revenue. I think it's going to take a huge hit especially for those who went to see it over the weekend and probably felt like me and didn't really like it. So that word of mouth is going to spread, and I think you're going to see less attendance going into Ghostbusters, even though I believe this upcoming weekend is Easter weekend here in the United States. I think it is the religious holiday of Easter. Uh, and usually during those holidays, you do get a lot of families going to theaters. And if I will say this, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is a nice family-friendly movie to go to. And it's generational, right? You have generations like myself who remember the original movies. You have maybe a little bit of the younger generation that grew up maybe watching the 2016 one or Afterlife, right? So yeah, I'm sure it, it's a nice safe bet for families for this upcoming weekend. And it's possible that... I. If I, I'll, I'll say this. I'm pretty sure most families, especially if you look at the religious families, they're probably going to go watch Ghostbusters over Godzilla, if I'm going to be completely honest. Because uh, I'm sure there's uh, a little over-the-top violence in Godzilla that I'm sure a lot of religious more uh, people are going to not want to see. However, I'm very curious as to what the, <laughs> what the religious people will think about the lesbian love story in Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. <laughs> I wonder what they're gonna take is gonna what their take is gonna be like on that. So so yeah, so I really do think Ghostbusters is gonna take a major, major slap in the face once Godzilla Kong comes out in theaters this weekend. Uh but we shall see. But I, I think it's gonna be a brutal showing overall. Uh Starlord, no other Ghostbusters will ever beat 84 Ghostbusters box office. I was born to that movie ready to bust ghost. First words were all right. This bitch is toast. Classic Peter Venkman line there. Wait a minute. Ghostbusters Frozen has a lesbian. <laughs> oh, 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 you just wait. I kind of hinted on it on Friday when I was talking about the movie. You know, when Phoebe befriends a ghost um, and, and does the whole Casper thing where she tries to turn herself into a ghost to be closer to her friend. Yeah, they hinted on it. It's sweet. It's cute. But, you know, read, read in between the tea leaves. And I, and I think you can kind of tell what they're trying to say there. Um, so I'm sure you're going to have a lot of people who are going to... That's going to be the next line of discourse coming out of this movie. Is the lesbian love story. The young lesbian love story. Because remember, in the movie, Phoebe's only 16, I believe. <laughs> Look, it didn't bother me either way. I just, just the whole time, the whole friendship thing, it just, I just kept thinking of that movie Casper. Casper the Friendly Ghost. And I, I don't know, maybe I remember that movie much differently than most. But I remember, one, I remember I was curious about it because Christina Ricci was in it. And I only knew her from the Addams Family movies. So I was like, oh, I wonder, I want to see what she does outside of that. I mean, Casper wasn't a great movie. But if I remember correctly, her character wanted to be closer to Casper. 
and I believe attempted to kill herself or or have something done to her so she could turn into a ghost. Am I wrong in remembering it that way? I don't know. I don't want to go back and watch it just to prove a point or to see if my memories are correct, but I'm pretty sure that was the plot. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, so, yeah. So I thought that was like a retread from the Casper movie, which was very, very interesting. And I know it sounds like kind of morbid, especially since Casper was supposed to be a, a kid friendly movie. But I don't think they were very explicit about it, but I'm pretty sure that was the case. I don't know. I could be wrong. Uh, so we, but we already had Patrick Swayze ghost when Whoopi Goldberg danced with Demi Moore. Yeah, we did. We sure did. That was another sweet moment, too, I thought. And now we have Roadhouse remake based on... Yeah. Hey, you know, Swayze, you know, it, it's nice that uh, he's getting a lot of nods this past weekend. A lot of parallels happening here. So with that said, let's talk about Roadhouse. So since we're on that topic, I'm going to be very honest here. The original Roadhouse movie with Patrick Swayze, although it's like a cult classic, it's not a great movie. It's really not. However, that being said, it is a classic because it was one of those perfect movies for the time with a very hot, young actor in Patrick Swayze doing his thing, his karate and boxing, right? I forget who the lady is, his co-star. She was pretty damn hot too for the time, right? And it was just one of those movies that just checked a lot of the boxes for that time. So hold on, let me pull it up here. Roadhouse, 1989. Yeah, it's a very, not only is it one of those quintessential 80s type movies, but as we were trans transitioning from 80s into the 90s, we were seeing more and more movies like this. Uh, Kelly Lynch is the name of, of the actress. And, I, you know, for what it's worth, they had good chemistry in there. And I'll never forget Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott for me was just... Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott. Again, if you know, you know. I think he's great. Great presence on screen. And... The, the, the premise is kind of simplistic, right? You have this guy who is hired to be a bouncer to help clean up a bar named the Roadhouse, right? And it's one of those bars that you see bar fights every night and all that. You know, we don't see movies these days anymore where a fight will just break out into a bar for no reason. But, you know... In this movie, it was an excuse to just have nonstop action here and there. Plus, of course, you have some love and romance, some sexy time. And you had to have that for a movie in the 80s going into the early 90s. So I remember watching this movie for the first time late night on HBO. Because uh, I never saw this in the theater. But I remember I was, I think I was vacationing at my brother's place in Massachusetts. And he had cable. Because I at that time, at that age, I didn't have cable at home. So I remember one night I was watching HBO and Roadhouse popped up. I'm like, oh, I, I'm curious about this. And I remember I was like, yeah. As, as a young kid like me, I was like, it had everything. It had action and fighting. I was like, oh, that's awesome. It had sexy time because Kelly Lynch is, is very hot, right? So I was like, oh, hot chick. <laughs> so it's like perfect for uh, puberty uh, laden boys like myself. It was like the perfect movie for that. And it was just one of those that was like a one and done things. Um, I don't remember how soon after uh, we lost Patrick Swayze. But when he passed, obviously, a lot of people referred to Roadhouse. A lot of people referred to Ghost. And, of course, a lot of people will refer to Dirty Dancing. But these are like the three main movies in Patrick Swayze's career that everyone will remember. It's either you remember him mostly for Dirty Dancing, Ghost, or Roadhouse. 
And those are the things that always come up. Family Guy always used to make fun of Roadhouse. Like every time like there would be like a, a fight or Peter wanted to take a stand, he would be like, Roadhouse. And it would be like a, a calling card thing, which I thought was kind of funny. So it stayed within the pop culture lexicon because of the type of movie it was. It, it's one of those just adrenaline-fueled, uh, I guess, you know, testosterone-induced type of movies. And it did what it did. It knew, it knew, it got the memo, it knew what it had to do, and it got the job done, right? So when I found out that they were doing a remake of it, I was I was surprised. I was like, oh, we're going to bring this back? Out of everything from back around that time, I was not expecting that this was going to be the one that they were going to bring back. But I'm like, all right, you know, a lot of time has passed since that original movie. I'm sure a lot of people grew, who are now kind of younger today have no idea what the original movie was. Right? So, yeah. I could see it happen. But also at the same time, we don't have movies like Roadhouse today. We don't have, you know, like these testosterone film. Oh, no, we do. It's called The Incredibles. Yeah, we, we do have testosterone induced, nonsensical, violent, action packed movies. It's called. <laughs> yeah, the, the the Incredibles, right? Is that that's the name of it, right? I'm saying it right. I forgot about that. Um, but but that is more of just like dream scenarios that we've always cooked into our heads. Like, what if we had an action movie with freaking Stallone and Schwarzenegger and Lundgren and Statham and Sure, why not? 50 Cent. And <laughs> what if we had action movies with all of these guys together teaming up? I mean, I guarantee you if Swayze was still around, he would have been cast in one of those movies. Hands down, for sure. You know, if if Brandon Lee was still around, he would have been cast in one of these movies for sure. You know, so we still get them from time to time. So maybe it's a great time to bring a movie back like that. Uh, the director of this movie is Doug Lyman, who is known for movies like some of the Jason Bourne movies, Edge of Tomorrow, which is like a great, in my opinion, underrated sci-fi movie with Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt. Love that movie. Um, he also made Mr. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> Not so great of a movie. Um, better series. Uh, with uh, Childish Gambino. Um, but uh, he made movies like American Made and all that. So he, this is a guy that is very familiar with action. And I believe it was produced by uh, Joey Silver. I believe that's his name. Uh, who, if you if you reckon, if the name sounds familiar, uh, he's the guy that used to team up with Brockheimer a lot in those type of like nonsensical action movies. Uh, Star Lord wasn't Roadhouse the last of the true 80s movies before the 90s days, uh, Days of Thunder. Yeah, it, it I would I would agree with that. Um, also, it's one of those movies where you could see the transitioning going into because it was 80s, but also it felt also like this is the new era we're going into because I feel like the 80s was kind of filled with campy action, but then. I feel like it was a campy action and trying to tie in a lot of sex appeal to it, which was a lot of like early 90s action movies. Sorry, <laughs> I thought I heard something funky going on here. Uh, no, it's nothing. Um, because I, I think in 90s, the 80s were all about um, kind of fun, camp, action. And then 90s was a lot of sex appeal. I think in the 90s, we brought in a lot of sex appeal to a lot of things. We got horny in the 90s, basically. I think from all the love and drugs from the 70s, then we got the Reagan era that came in that kind of like 
you know, the dare, dare campaigns and this is your brain on drugs. And we kind of slowed down a little bit on that. We kind of like put a cap on it. And then in the 90s, we just blew up because we got all horny because we had a decade of none of that. None of the stuff we got from the 70s. That's kind of like how I look at it. So it was like a, one of those like transitional type of movies uh, that it still feels 80s, but also we were getting a little bit of what to expect in the 90s like that. You know, by the way, mentioning Days of Thunder, too, that's another favorite movie of mine. I love that movie. Like, if you were to ask me what are my top Tom Cruise movies, Days of Thunder would be way up there. Uh, yeah, 90s was the Bill Clinton era, hence horny. Get it? I'm going to come. Playing his saxophone on Arsenio. We see you, Clinton. So, yeah, so, you know, Doug Lyman, familiar with the action genre. So I, I was definitely curious. And plus, I am a big fan of Jake Gyllenhaal. I think he is, when he commits to a role, he freaking commits, man. Like Southpaw, he was really good in that movie, even though Southpaw wasn't, wasn't like the best movie. I recently went through Denny Villeneuve's filmography, and I talked about it on a podcast, on the, the Movie Time podcast with my friend Blake which will be uh, being posted this week. But he worked with Hall in two movies. Well, in several movies. But I, I remember in Enemy and in Prisoners. And I just like Hall as an actor. So him playing the role of Dalton, I was like, oh, man, this is going to be interesting because you know he's going to commit. If anything, he's definitely going to commit 100% in this role. And then I started hearing, like, Post Malone was in it and... Uh, was that Conor McGregor is in it because they're changing things up that now Dalton is an ex UFC fighter. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess you kind of have to make it a little bit more modern to today so that people can understand. Cause you don't really hear it today. Like, Oh, I'm a black belt in karate. So yeah, you don't really hear that much anymore. Um, so it makes sense to make it an ex UFC fighter for today. Um, so yeah, so, you know, it takes place in Florida. It, Roadhouse is still called Roadhouse. Another person in it that I was happy to see is Jessica Williams because I watched Shrinking on Apple, I believe earlier this year, and she was a fantastic character, in, in, actress in, in Shrinking. If you haven't seen that, that series, it's with uh, Harrison Ford and Jason Segel. Really funny series. It's really, really good. Um, so Jessica plays the owner of the bar and uh, an actress who I never heard of before, Daniela Melchior, Melchior plays Ellie. She's the, the, the one who the, the blonde actress plays in uh, the original Roadhouse. So she's the doctor, right? Um, and then you have Billy Magnuson, who I've seen in several movies before, playing Ben Brandt. He's like the main protagonist in the movie. And Conor McGregor plays a character called Knox, who is kind of like the the I guess on the the bad side, he is like the the hitman. He's like the the go to guy to to fix problems and situations, right? So the premise basically stays the same. It's basically you know, uh, Gyllenhaal gets hired to help clean up this bar, and he you know he deals with the local ruffians and the gangs and gets caught up in this web of this guy trying to take over the roadhouse because he's trying to build like these new establishments or a community or whatever. He had a, he has something that he wants to build and the roadhouse is standing in his way. And Jillian Hall plays like the reluctant, I don't want to get involved, but then eventually gets involved because he, you know, he falls in love with the people there essentially. And, you know, takes matters into his own hands and, and you know, helps the, the community out and all. So it's, again, very basic storyline, very simple. And Jake Gyllenhaal really was committed in this role. He really was. I actually like him in this, in this role. He is always happy-go-lucky, a huge smile on his face. But when you push the buttons a little bit way too much, that's when the craziness comes out. And... The thing that kind of got him out of UFC fighting into now he fights for money, 
like at local establishments and now takes on a job like this is because he accidentally kills a guy in the ring in the octagon and i guess he get he got banished or in his own way he banished himself because he feels sorry for something like that and uh you know that's why he finds where he is right now and for the most part the movie is nonsensical it's just it's made for this generation now because there isn't really a moment of story. You get little bits here and there when he's talking to like the locals and they're telling him about the, the, the town and the community that lives there. And, you know, he finds out a little bit of uh, whatchamacallit, of, um, you know, the background of the owner of the establishment and he gets friendly with the doctor. The doctor is also kind of like him. No nonsense and all. So you get little bits in here. But it's really simply made for this generation where we need something every 5 to 10 minutes. And basically, every there is something that happens every 5 to 10 mo- minutes here. And, and for the most part, it does its job fine. You know, you had Post Malone that showed up just in the beginning you know, fighting for money at a local establishment. That's where we see Jake Gyllenhaal show up for the first time. And then, you know, when it when everyone sees it's him, he's a well-recognized UFC fighter. And, you know, it is what it is, right? And Post Malone is just like, I'm not going to fight against this guy, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's he was there. It was like a one-and-done thing. Conor McGregor plays this, I, I don't know which movie Conor thought he was in, uh, but he was really, really off the wall, just kind of like mustache twirling comic book version of a villain. And he just can't act, you know, but it was so silly, his performance, that it, it was just very comical. It is kind of like a throwback to like those villains you've seen in the late 80s, early 90s type of action movies like this, where you can't really take him seriously. And his boss, Billy Magnuson, or I should say he's the son of the boss, is just another one of those ruthless type of he doesn't want to get his own hands dirty. So he has all of these people working for him. And it was just it was just really silly. And it was like a it is basically essentially a throwback to those type of storylines and movies from back in the day. What's, what's going on, Scottish Geek Guy? Nice to see you back here. Watched the Roadhouse remake two nights ago. Watched the Swayze OG last night. The new one, sadly, just ain't that good of... Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm talking... It's, it's funny you chimed in now. I am talking about it right now. Um, and, you know, going going through my feelings and thoughts about it. But it, it definitely is not... I, I will say this, too. I mean, I, and I said this at the top of when I started talking about this. The OG is not a great movie, either. But it's like a perfect movie for the time. Um, so when you have a movie that's not really that great of a movie, but it's iconic because of who's in it and the time it came out, and you're doing a remake of that because the original movie has like a cult following. It's like cult status following. Don't expect this to be a great movie either. you know. And look, there are some things in this movie that I liked. Like I said, the Jake Gyllenhaal character, like Jake's portrayal, I liked. I liked him. I liked his commitment in this role. But then there are other things I like. I didn't like. Like Conor McGregor was just really silly to watch. And the fight scenes were just fake. That's my number one complaint here. Is all the fight scenes were digitally edited and most of the time CG. And you can tell, you can really tell. It's so obvious and it was just a major league disappointment. Even in the first, like when you saw Post Malone fighting whoever he's fighting, you can tell they digitally are cutting here, cutting there. And they had to do this thing where as if you're hovering around their shoulders or you're in the ring with them and you're going around and you're seeing the fight up close and personal or you see the point of view of the fighter or you know you know seeing the person hit you and he's hitting the camera but everything just looked so fake nothing looked real and that's one thing i'll say the original is good at because that was the time that they still did a lot of practical stunt effects 
But here, 90% of the fights were all fake. Especially the one-on-one -on -one fights that Jake Gyllenhaal was in. The fight with, with Conor McGregor, even though it was very brutal on screen, and I kind of dug how it ended too with like the stabbing of Conor McGregor multiple times and the ruthlessness and the viciousness of it. It's all digital. It's all CG. You know, and it was just, it was just very, you know, distracting. And I was just like, why did they have to do it this way? Because it saved them money? Because maybe they didn't want to hurt Jake <laughs> during the process? You know, I would have preferred it if they did the thing where they had the stuntmen fighting each other. And they did like the digital remasking of the faces just to have their faces on. I would have preferred that. But here, there are many moments where you could tell right straight up, like the body was full CG. And it was very distracting, very, very distracting. And I was just like, I don't understand why they were doing this. And then the the, the, the love story portion of it just didn't work. It I didn't I wasn't convinced that this felt like real love. I didn't I wasn't convinced that it was sexy at all. No. Not like the OG. The OG, they knew how to be like how to work sex appeal. They really did. You know, and I, I, I don't want to take anything away from the actors because I felt like they did their job from based on what they were told to. But there was just a lot of things that were just missing across the board. And, you know, outside of Jake Gyllenhaal's performance and commitment to the role, the movie itself was just, eh, it's, it's one of those things that it's nice to have running in the background that you pay attention to every now and then. That's what I'll say. It's if you just wanted to check your brain at the door and just plop in front of the TV and just watch something that was very nonsensical, yeah, you would get some entertainment out of this. It 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 reminds me very much of a typical Schumacher kind of Bruckheimer type of action type movie. And it kind of flowed like that. And Doug Lyman has, has worked in a, uh, you know, within those lines. So it felt very much like that. You know, but without, I guess, but I guess without the Bruckheimer charm, if that makes any sense. Yeah. With, without the, the Joel Silver um, kind of charm to it. I felt like they were trying to recapture that charm but i felt like a lot of that was missing but if it wasn't for i i think this movie would have been a slightly better if the fight scenes were real and not so digitally enhanced and digitally edited because that really took me out of the movie and i remember like even though i was trying so hard to get into a lot of the fight scenes i was like oh my god i was critiquing it i was critiquing all the digital moments i'm like why are they doing that why are they doing that Oh my god, that's not real. That's not him. He didn't really fall there. You know, I was just like, you could I could even tell where the cuts were made. Like digital to to live action. Like, like I could tell when those cuts were being made. I'm just like, what why am I critiquing this thing? Why can't I just enjoy it for what it was? And I, I couldn't. I just really couldn't. You know? And that's a shame because for a movie like that, you kind of just want to like get lost in it. And for the most part, I just, I was distracted. I was distracted. So yeah, so if I was to give this a rating on Letterboxd, which I will after after uh, after the, the stream this morning, I'll, I'll give it three out of five stars. It wasn't terrible, terrible, but it wasn't good. You know, it's, it's middling at best. So yeah, Roadhouse. If you want to watch it, go watch the original one. That's my recommendation right there. Uh, Star Lord, no comparison. It's the OG Roadhouse versus the new one. Just a house by the road. <laughs> it's Road Treehouse. Road Treehouse of Horror. <laughs> it's funny. What you know what's funny though? They did kind of poke fun at the name in the movie. Where you have Jake Gyllenhaal asking the owner, Why do you call it Roadhouse? He's like it's already a roadhouse, so why do you call it roadhouse? And she was explaining it like, well, yeah, it's 
It's a roadhouse, but it's road house. And then afterwards, she's like, yeah, my dad just had a weird sense of humor. <laughs> and then I guess the, the bar came with a boat that she inherited and Jake Gyllenhaal decides to stay on the boat. And she she's like, uh, just a heads up warning. My dad also owned that boat and named it too. And what did the boat, what was the name of the boat? The boat. <laughs> so at least in a way, they were very self-aware about that. Very self-aware. So yeah. Roadhouse. You blew it! So yeah, there you go. So it is what it is. You know, I wouldn't go out of, out of, I wouldn't recommend you going out of your way to watch it. But yeah, you know, if you just want something silly to watch and, and kind of, I guess, like Madam Web was a very throwback to 90, like late 90s, 2000s action filmmaking especially superhero action filmmaking, then Roadhouse, the new one, is kind of a nice throwback or homage to late 80s, early 90s action movies, if that makes any sense. So. But with all digital fighting, which sucked. So. Take that as you wish. So there you go. So that's Roadhouse. 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 Why am I singing that? <laughs> All right. Give me one second. I'm just checking some things on my phone. So, um... Scottish Geek Guy, I don't know if you're still here. But, yeah, those are my thoughts. And I am i don't know if they equal to what you think, too. But I would love to hear more of your thoughts about it. All right, just give me one second, guys. Sorry. Oh, another thing about this weekend... I, I didn't bring this up. Oh, there's a lot of headlines popping in. Let's see. Hold on. I'm just going to mouth these off real quick. Just some of these headlines I'm seeing. Anne Hathaway not getting any roles after winning an Oscar. Because studios were worried about how toxic my identity had become online. I had an angel in Christopher Nolan who did not care about that and gave me one of the most beautiful roles I've had. And that is about her role in Interstellar. Which, again, I can't say this enough. Interstellar is such a fantastic movie. Like, seriously. Like, out of the Christopher Nolan movies, top two, easily for me, are Oppenheimer and Interstellar. Love that movie so much. And Anne Hathaway was indeed good in that movie. I will say that. Uh, Euphoria season three has been delayed. Not sure why that is. Uh, I have a feeling it's probably scheduling conflicts with Zendaya. Because I know Sydney Sweeney said she was um, filming episodes for it. In the last week or two, but something tells me Zendaya is probably super busy. Or maybe there's something more because it says here uh, season three has been delayed. Filming was meant to start soon, but actors have been told to explore other jobs. Maybe there's something wrong with the writing. Maybe they're not happy with the script. Let's see here. Just other things I'm just looking about. Uh, 
Well, the Anne Hathaway quote is making the rounds this morning for sure. That's interesting. You know, it's interesting to always see what the trades put focus on. It's always fascinating to me to see that because as you as you should all know by now, a lot of these trade publications and outlets, a lot of studios have their hands in their pockets. Some studios and conglomerates actually own some of these uh, trades. And, uh, you know, these are things that if you know, you know. So whenever you see a narrative like that out there, it makes me question and wonder if they are, they are putting that out there on purpose. Because Anne Hathaway does have a movie coming out soon, so maybe this could be a form of publicity for her. Oh, yeah, there was a Rebel Wilson claim that went out this morning about Sasha Baron Cohen, and she called him an asshole. So a rep for Sasha Baron Cohen responds to Rebel Wilson's claim, saying these demonstrably false claims are directly contradicted by extensive detailed evidence, including contemporaneous uh, documents, film footage, and eyewitness accounts. Ooh, this could be the next big uh, gossipy drama. Or at least this week, at least. Um... Yeah, that's that's pretty much just a recap of just these are just headlines that just basically um, are starting to, for lack of a better way to say it, are like hitting the the outlets this morning. Starlord, Madam Web is a callback to late. Never do that again. And early, what the fuck we did. <laughs> You're not going to get an argument from me on that one. You are not going to get an argument from me on that one. All right. I think it's time. Let's let's do headlines, shall we? Hit the music for headlines. It's headlines time. Headlines time. I'm going to drink coffee and read some of the news. It could be good. It could be bad. I'm getting lazy with these intros. <laughs> <laughs> you blew it! All right, this is a portion of the morning where I sip my coffee and just read some of the news. So here's my coffee. And here's some of the news. So Margot Robbie is has found her next major IP to work on, and that is The Sims. Margot Robbie to produce Sims movie. I'm here on Dark Horizons. Barbie star Margot Robbie and her Lucky Chap production company Label is set to produce a film adaptation of the long-running game life simulation franchise The Sims. In addition to Kate, in addition, sorry, Kate Heron, who directed the first season of Marvel Studios' Loki, will direct and co-write the film alongside Brioni Redman. In the game, players control virtual avatars and have them do all manners of things, from building homes to falling in love, raising children, even killing their characters. Successive expansion packs and games allow the player to do more and more. The first game debuted in 2000. Oh my God, 2000. Jeez. Um, blah, 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 blah. And 20th Century Studios attempted to film ad adaptation back in 2007 with Brian Lynch penning the script. That version remained in development hell until Disney acquired Fox and it was canceled. This marks a whole new incarnation of the project. Robbie, Roy Lee, Josie McNamara, and Tom Ackerley will produce... Plot specifics are under wraps. I'm pretty sure Margot Robbie has the potential to be starring in said Sims movie. Um, sure, why not? I mean, how how would a movie like this work? Are we going to be kind of like in Barbie, um, be in the Sims the Sims universe in the Sim in the Sims world, and seeing how? all these avatars interact with each other and is Margot Robbie just going to be another one of those avatars and is it going to be like a Lego movie situation where 
there is an outside component of someone on the computer playing these characters, maybe it becomes self-aware and they start talking to each other in real life. Who knows? I don't know what, what's going on. But um, interesting property for Margot to latch on to after her success with Barbie. But who knows? It could be something that's interesting to see. I mean, if they're going to make a Minecraft movie, why not? I just remember playing The Sims when it first came out. And I remember the big deal, <laughs> especially when you found out that you can have sex with your with other avatars or with other Sims people, was to to get a nudity patch. There was such a thing as a nudity patch because when the Sims were having sex, it was like this big scrambled jumbled graphic and like the weird Sims type noises, you know, like like that. Um, and I remember like it was such a big deal. It's like, oh my God, did you hear they released a nudity patch? So now you can see the Sims really having sex with each other. It was so stupid. But every time I played the Sims, I always ended up burning my house down. I don't know why. I think my 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 sim was stupid. You know, that or he was a pyro. Because every time he barbecued outside, it it turned into a big fire and my house burnt down. And he always ended up dying and burning. So after after like the third time that happened to me, I stopped playing. I was like, this Sims is not for me. Because for whatever reason, I always end up just burning and killing myself. And my house goes in up in flames. So yeah. So it was never it was never a game for me. Um, but I know a lot of people love playing The Sims. Um, it, it's a nice little escape, I guess, from everyday from everyone's everyday life. And they a lot of people are fulfilling their dreams in games like this, which is interesting, I guess, in a certain way. But you know, I guess that's one of the reasons why games like this serve a purpose. But yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how they approach this script for this movie. I'll be really interested to see how that all turns out. So kudos for Margot Robbie for latching onto another property like that. Uh, Starlord, it's still surprising that Ghostbusters has a lesbian scene. What next? Walter Peck identified as trans. Well, that would make sense, actually, because he's dickless. Why don't you thank him, dickless? Best line in that movie. Best line in that movie. All right, moving on to other headlines here. Uh, to celebrate, right, what is it, the 25th anniversary now of Phantom Menace, Lucasfilm has decided, Lucasfilm and Disney, I should, I, I should say, has decided to set a nine-film Star Wars marathon. Lucasfilm has announced today, this was back on Thursday, March 21st, that in celebration of the 25th anniversary of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, fans will have the chance to experience the entire Skywalker saga in theaters on May the 4th, a.k.a. Star Wars Day. All nine episodic films will screen in chronological order, starting with the prequel trilogy, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, Star Wars Attack of the Clones, Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. That will be followed by the original trilogy, Star Wars A New Hope, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars Return of the Jedi, and then the sequel trilogy, Star Wars The Force Awakens, Last Jedi, and Rise of Skywalker. The screenings will also boast an exclusive look at the upcoming Disney Plus series, The Acolyte, which is set during the High Republic era and which launched its trailer earlier in the week to record numbers for a Disney Plus series. That preview will be part of the Phantom Menace screenings. The screenings will not include the Rogue One or Solo films, nor any of the subsequent Disney Plus series like Andor, The Mandalorian, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and The Book of Boba Fett. Those attending will receive a special limited edition poster. Tickets go on sale Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. So, you know, these marathons are fun if you're there with, with the right group of people. Um, make the sound bit. Oh, Star Lord, you have my word. The minute that movie is available is available digitally, I am going to clip that out, one thousand percent, because that clip, that audio clip, is just so damn hilarious to me. It is, 
especially since it was so unexpected and it just came out from out of nowhere. It, it reminds me of which movie was it? The Rob Schneider movie. Uh, was it Gigolo or was it the you know where he plays like the Gigolo? And you know he would go out on dates with like all of these like random women. And there's this one woman that's like really, really tall, so tall that you can't see her on the screen. And every time they walk everywhere, you just hear someone in the background saying, that's a huge bitch. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it, or was it like the, the really fat girl? I, I forget which one it was, but I remember every time it'll just be someone in the back. Just be like, that's a huge bitch. And that line would crack me up all the damn time, all the time. It was just so funny. So every time, every time there's like this random, you know, person that screams something out like that. Oh man, I just I'll lose it if done right, and it's a funny line. I will lose it every every single time, every single time. But yeah, so, um. Or half baked. Yeah, I see them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just so funny. I love those type of lines. Um, but yeah, like these marathons. So I I done a Star Wars marathon like this before. Uh, with some of my buddies and an ex at the time. This was leading into the release of The Force Awakens when The Force Awakens came out. So what what a lot of theaters did is that they did a Star Wars marathon where you went through the three prequels, the four orig the three original movies. So prequel trilogy, original trilogy, leading into The Force Awakens release. Um, so that was like, what? Seven movies in a day. And it was tough. I will say it was tough. Prior to that, I did a marathon where... I sat through the extended cuts of Fellowship of the Ring, extended cut of The Two Towers, leading into the midnight release of Return of the King. And that was fun, too. Because, you know, if you're with a good group of people, it's fun. It's exciting. You know, it, it, it's, like, it's like having a sleepover with a bunch of fellow fans. And I love doing stuff like that. I, right now, at my age... I don't have the patience for that anymore because the last marathon I ever did, and I think this is the one that broke me. This was going into, oh, which movie was it? I want to say, was it Age of Ultron? Yeah, I think this was going into Age of Ultron. Avengers Age of Ultron. So, some theaters did like a Marvel movie marathon where you watched Iron Man 1 all the way to the midnight release of Age of Ultron. I think it was 12 movies. Let's count them down. Or actually, you know what? Let, let's get some help from, you know, there's this interesting um, website called Google that can help do things. Um, let's see here. All right. So was it Age of Ultron? Yeah, it was. Okay. So it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. So it's like 11 movies I watched in one theater during a marathon. So just think about this. Iron Man, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2, Thor, Captain America, First Avenger, Marvel's The First Avengers, or Marvel's Avengers, Iron Man 3, Thor Dark World, Captain America Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, and then Avengers Age of Ultron. And this marathon broke me. Because it's one of those things where, yeah, it sounded like a great idea at the time. And it was going to be super exciting. 
up until I would say when I was done watching, I think the end of Avengers. Because I started to feel it. I really started to feel it. <laughs> now, the great part about the theater I saw this at was that they allowed you to step outside and take a breather. They didn't really keep you in there. So if you wanted to step out, you could like walk around. You could even go outside the theater for a bit, get some fresh air. You know, and I used to smoke at that time, so those would be like my smoke breaks. But also when you do something like this, you had to kind of time your sleeping. Because there's no way you could stay up for all of these movies in one sitting. So I planned that I was going to nap during Iron Man 3, because out of all the Iron Mans, those, that's like the most boring one. And plus it was followed by Thor The Dark World, which of course I think in my opinion is one of the worst Marvel movies or one of the worst Marvel movies ever made. So I'm like, oh, that's perfect because that would at least give me four hours worth of sleep during those two movies. So I was able to nap for the most part during Iron Man 3 and Thor The Dark World. But even after that small nap, you know, you still had two more movies before Age of Ultron popped up. So it it was like a test of endurance. It really was an endurance test. But I made it. I watched it all the way. As we exited after Age of Ultron completed, everyone got like a like a gold plated Avengers medal as kind of like a badge of honor that hey, you made it. You 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 survived the 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 marathon. I don't even know if I still have that medal. I don't know if I have it or maybe I sold it on eBay or something like that. <laughs> but I do have the lanyard with the ticket uh, that says uh, the Marvel Marathon, whatever. And then I remember when I saw the, the Lord of the Rings Marathon, we all got uh, to take home a celluloid film strip from one of the movies, which I thought was pretty awesome. So I, I like it that they award you for enduring such a thing. When I saw the Star Wars marathon, we got like a goodie bag with like a commemorative ticket. I think there was a t-shirt and a bag and, and stuff like that. The people in the theaters were someone made like homemade. Oh no, the theater made homemade Millennium Falcon cookies, which was pretty awesome. So they passed that around. So when you have like people who are catering to such an event and they make it fun for everybody, it's a fun environment. You know, so I recommend people who have that type of endurance to to try it out, to to really do something like that, because it is a lot of fun. But I, I personally don't think I have it in me to do those things anymore. I think I'm, I'm past that now. If I'm going to do something like that, I'd rather do it at home. You know, have a group of people at home and we'll have our own sleepover. You know, I think that would be like a lot of fun. Um. But to be in a location, in like a, a theater, to do a marathon like this, I don't think I can do it anymore. Yeah. I just don't have it in me. But kudos to people who, who have the, the moment too. And hopefully, when you have a chance to do that, you can enjoy some blue milk with it. Because, da 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 Star Wars blue milk officially will be hitting shelves very soon. This is not a joke. It's not April Fool's Day. Not yet. But we are finally going to get ourselves official Star Wars Blue Milk. Lucasfilm has released a bunch of new products as part of the month-long celebration of Star Wars villainy. Though their various products on offer, attention is all swirling around one beverage collaboration with milk brand True Moo. And that is Blue Milk. The Star Wars True Moo Blue Milk by Dairy Farmers of America True Moo is described as a delicious vanilla flavored milk with blue food coloring. Blue milk, blue milk is a popular beverage found on the outer rim in the Star Wars galaxy and is seen in the original 77 Star Wars film. Also, you could see it in um, what is it? Uh, the second of the new movies. You know, where the Kamudrin Luke Skywalker, you could see him drinking the blue milk uh, with a mm, blue milk 
as he milked that weird creature uh, near the water. Uh, for the production, that milk was made from blah, blah, blah. Fans can expect to see it on store shelves beginning April 17. Aside from the fact that you can check for the obvious bottle of blue liquid, you can see an image below of what the packaging will look like when you venture off to find it. Blue and green milk smoothies are already available as part of the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge selection of Disney's theme park, which is true. Because when I was at Galaxy's Edge, I had blue milk. But it's a smoothie. It's not even milk related. It's just basically, just think of like an icy drink, like a smoothie drink that's blue. Uh, I'm pretty sure I have a picture of it somewhere. But I make a, I'm make. i going to make a promise to all of y'all. When April 17 comes around, I'm going to hunt down and see if I, could if I could find myself some of this blue milk. And I will drink it live on stream. I will. I promise. So... Blue milk coming soon to a grocery store near you. And you know what? It would be fun if if this comes out in time for those people doing the marathon because that'll be like a nice fun thing for all of them to have. It's like, hey, everyone, we're drinking blue milk. So, so uh, we should have Oprah herself give away a car for Madam Webb. <laughs> okay. I'll try the blue milk. Yeah, it's like ice cream. Oh, have you been to Galaxy's Edge? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the blue milk that they have there. So yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm kind of excited to check that out. Get some of that blue milk. Speaking of Star Wars and sticking with the Star Wars realm, Acolyte showrunner talks multi-season plans. We already got the first trailer last week. And it scored 51.3 million views across all platforms in 24 hours which made it the highest number of Star Wars, the highest uh, views to any trailer for a Star Wars series on Disney+. Plus. Uh, but what wasn't shown in that release was the number of dislikes of the clip on YouTube. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands and more dislikes than likes. So it definitely got ratioed. Uh, but that isn't stopping any anticipation. Uh, speaking with Collider recently about the new series, showrunner Leslie Headland cleared up a couple of details. First up, she confirms the average episode runtime is 30 to 35 minutes with the finale at 40 minutes. Wow, this is this is going to be a really quick short series, short season. Very quick episodes. The trailer included, uh, included footage from four to five episodes and not the whole series, which runs for eight episodes. Headland also says she envisioned the series as a multi-season show. Uh, quote, there are a lot of things at the end of the season that I think are narrative threads that are not tied up for sure. However, I am the type of writer that's not interested in an emotional cliffhanger. I want you to feel like you've had a particular type of catharsis and an emotional experience in watching those eight episodes because I like rewarding the audience with that. These things take forever to make, so I would hate to make a season that didn't feel complete, even if it was still open for more story. Interesting. So, yeah, there could be multiple seasons, but also it sounds like she's trying to make it so that you don't have to depend on a second season to enjoy the first season. So, look, you take it for what you you take it for what it's worth. I I'm looking forward to it. I don't know why there's so much hate towards it. I think it's a mixed bag of dislike of her because of comments she's made in the past about her feelings about the Star Wars universe and about the Star Wars, you know, the Star Wars uh, lore and what George Lucas did with the series. Um, I think there's just also a mixed feeling of emotions when it comes to Star Wars in general. Uh, I'm pretty sure a majority of them are doing the whole, oh, we're getting another woke Star Wars because all we see are female you know, Jedi and blah, 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 whatever. I'm looking forward to it. I'm always excited every time a new Star Wars thing comes out. And most of the time I am disappointed, but, you know, it is what it is. That's that's what happens in fandom. Not everything is going to be great. You know, I'm someone who is so used to uh, reading comic books that not every comic book I picked up was good. But every now and then you get those bangers and you're just like, oh, man, this is a great story. So we'll see what happens. But it's interesting to, to hear that this is the mentality going into the season. 
Uh, no, but I think so. Milk comes in many forms. Milk does come in many forms. Breast milk. <laughs> Why did I say breast milk? I'm gonna come. All right, speaking of regurgitating things from the past, who is asking for a sequel to Happy Gilmore? Well, Netflix is. So Happy Gilmore sequel is in the works. That's right, Happy Gilmore. A former co-star of Adam Sandler indicates the actor is apparently working on a sequel to his 1995 golfing-themed hit, Happy Gilmore. The first film saw Sandler as a failed hockey player who finds unexpected success on the pro golf tour. Though it only made $38 million at the box office, it was a massive home video success and is one of Sandler's most famous works. Definitely have a huge cult following here. Veteran actor Christopher McDonald, who plays Shooter McGavin, you know, Shooter. The original film and an interview today in Cleveland's 92.3, The Fan, he said. I saw Adam about two weeks ago and he says to me, McDonald, you're gonna love this. I said, what? He says, how about that? He shows me the first draft of Happy Gilmore 2. Maybe you should cut that out because I don't want to be a liar, but he did show me that and I thought... Well, that would be awesome. So it's in the works. Fans demand it. Damn it. Are they demanding it? I don't know about that. Universal currently owns the rights to the franchise, but whether they're producing at all is unclear. Sandler has a major contract with Netflix at present, and this it, it reportedly falls under that contract. Sandler recently set a comedy special for this streamer, which will be directed by Josh Safdie of the Safdie Brothers fame. So... I don't know, man. Some things should just be left alone. And when it comes to a movie like Happy Gilmore, yes, I, I love the movie. I think it's hilarious. That is kind of, that is an era of Sandler that we're never going to see again. If I'm to be very honest with all of you out there. And I don't, kind of like what he did with, what was that? What's that movie he did with all of his buddies? The fun guys or whatever guys or whatever. Like, I feel like this is just another attempt like that. He's going to cast. He's going to get all of his friends cast in this movie. It's just another excuse for them to all hang out. And it's probably going to suck. So it is what it is, you know. But during that era of Sandler, I don't think you could beat it. You know, you had... What is that? You had Gilmore. You had Billy Madison. Uh, my favorite of his movies is Big Daddy. I love that movie. Really, really funny. But remember, he had a lot of stinkers too. Little Nicky. Uh, was it Eight Crazy Nights, the animated movie? Which I didn't think was that funny at all. Um. Oh, what's that other movie that he is like... he? inherits all like the mansion oh my god what is that oh whatever it was it was god awful god awful so I, I i think when it comes to sandler you have to remember those things and then you know he's had hidden misses with netflix he's had a crazy run with netflix with all the movies that he's producing for them and and you know starring in you know, but I think out of all the Netflix stuff, Herbie Halloween was okay. Is it Herbie or Hubie Halloween? I don't know. The Halloween movie he did was okay. Spaceman was, you know, mediocre. But uh, I don't know. I don't think we need another Gilmore movie. But if the, the if the fans are demanding it, why not? Have at it, brother. You do you. Solar is going to be woke Happy Gilmore where his daughter beats the shit out of all. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. He did do what's that? The bar mitzvah movie with his daughters, right? Apparently, a lot of people love that movie. I, I haven't seen it. And I don't know if I'm going to have any desire to see it. Um, I'm just not. Just not. a. Uh, I don't know. Just not excited about that stuff. 
Speaking of sequels, let's remain on the whole sequel train here. And something that I wasn't even made aware of. Did you know that for the next Captain America that Sebastian Stan is not going to be in it? What? So here, this was taken from the Radio Times. Anthony Mackie is disappointed that Captain America Brave New World won't include Sebastian Stan and Daniel Bruhl. When they, when they decided to go back to the movies, it is what it is, but I don't have my friends anymore, so it kind of dampens it a little bit. What? How can you have a new Captain America movie that is going to be the first movie with the new Anthony Mackie Captain America and not have Bucky or... Daniel Bruhl in it. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I think that is just the dumbest thing I ever heard. What's happening? What's going on with that stuff? That really doesn't make any sense to me. You know, especially when you finished a, a series, a show, you know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And then, you know, of course, it's now Captain America and the Winter Soldier. And I think a lot of people who enjoyed that show, and there's a good amount of people who did, were hoping for the continued adventures of those two together. And now you're not going to have the buddy, the buddy cop adventure together anymore. Like, that's a missed opportunity. I think at this point, I'd, I'd rather them not even make the movie anymore. I'd rather them just go back. Just go, just, yes, you know, go back to the writing, to the drawing board and maybe do something else. Because you're going to get a lot of people who are going to be disappointed with the lack of that, that duo together. I just think that's a dumb, that's a big misstep. Big, big, big misstep. Bill and Ted 3 did the same thing in a way. Oh, with the with the with the siblings, right? Yeah. Not siblings, with the with the the children. Yeah, in a way. But it wasn't it wasn't that like it wasn't that overbearing as some productions might do. In a way, it kind of fit. I have a little soft spot in my heart for Bill and Ted 3. I think that was like a good attempt at just giving us another glimpse into that life, into that universe. And it could have been much worse, but I, I, there's a part of me that kind of appreciates that movie a little bit. Far better than Clerks 3, in my opinion. Clerks 3 was just what was happening in that movie. I didn't like that movie one bit. Do I want them to continue doing movies like that anymore? No. I think once you once you do the third one, that's it. You're you're good to go. You don't need to come back. But it was just nice to kind of see those guys again. You know, and to be in that realm. But I haven't watched it since that time it came out. So don't know if I'm going to be wanting or willing to watch it again anytime soon. All right, moving on to this next piece of news. We have we have now more details about the Joker movie, the new Joker movie coming out. Because everyone is curious. Some, I would say, are bitching at the fact that it's a musical. And for the longest time, I've been saying that in my the way I look at it, the way they're approaching this movie is that he is going to be in the asylum and we're going to see a lot of glimpse into his psyche. And I think he's going to be imagining and going through motions of a musical in his head. That's kind of my take on it. I could be wrong, especially now based with all of these additional details that we're getting now. So big question is Joker Foley de Adieu. Is it a musical or not? The general belief has been that the film will unfold almost entirely within Gotham City's Arkham Asylum 
and will have musical elements. In addition, the film will take visual inspiration from Francis, Cord uh, Francis Ford Coppola's lavish musical, One from the Heart. Then last month, director of photography Lawrence Scher seemed to downplay the musical elements, revealing it's got some music. It's not a musical per se, but it's just like, it just has music in it. That's all. Now Variety has broken down more details on the film's music. The trade says, according to those who've worked on the film, the movie is mostly a jukebox musical with at least 15 reinterpretations of very well-known songs. One of those songs is That's Entertainment from the 1953 musical The Bandwagon. Whether the project will include any original song is not known at this time, nor are any of the other numbers. However, one thing all will have in common is Oscar-winning composer Hilder... Whoa, how are you going to pronounce this name? Hilder... Bueno <laughs> You blew it! ...will add her distinctive haunting cues to each number. Joaquin Phoenix, Lady Gaga, Zazie Beetz, Catherine Keener and Brendan Gleeson star whilst Phillips collaborated on the screenplay with Scott Silver. The budget, the, the budget for the sequel has reportedly neared $200 million, more than triple of the original film, scheduled to hit theaters on October 4th. I'm pretty sure now a lot of that money is probably to pay for the rights for a lot of the, the music they're using. Now that I'm hearing this. So what exactly is a jukebox musical so let's let's look it up just so we could have clarification to those who may not be familiar with like the industry lingo right so this is according to dictionary.com a jukebox musical is a musical that uses songs that are not original to the play or movie and are integrated into the plot the songs are usually well known popular music songs rather than original music some jukebox musicals use a wide variety of songs, while others focus on songs performed by one singer or band, or written by one songwriter. An example of a jukebox musical is Mamma Mia, which uses songs by ABBA. So that should give you an idea of what this new Joker movie is going to be like. I'm sure there's going to have their talking moments, their serious moments, but then there are going to be moments where maybe something will mention something and then that's going to break into a musical number, right? So that, in essence, is a jukebox musical. I think other jukebox musicals, now that I know that definition, I would say Rock of Ages comes to mind. I remember that movie. I think Tom Cruise was in that movie too. Uh, Mamma Mia is a great example of that. Moulin Rouge. That's another great example of that. So I'm still down. I think it's still going to be an interesting take in, in putting the Joker through this type of movie. I, I trust Todd Phillips. I thought he did a banger of a job in the first one. I, I'm a huge fan of Joaquin Phoenix. I think he does a great job in this movie as well, in the first one as well. It'll be interesting to see the type of chemistry he has with Lady Gaga. You know? Um, I'm slowly getting more and more convinced that she could act, but I'm holding some reservation there, but I don't know. Overall, I, I'm still very much interested and, uh, this could be something that's really fascinating to me. I don't know. Star-Lord, Matrix 4, Trinity, and Neo are both the one. If I remember correctly, they do it with everything. Even Jay and Silent Bob reboot did it. Um... I didn't like Matrix Four. I thought that movie was trash. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying, not because you're a comment. I just, it, it made me think back on that movie. I'm just like, what the fuck was this movie? Um, Jay and Silent. That one, that reboot was charming. It was kind of sweet, and I liked, I liked the fact that they acknowledge that they're getting older. At least, you know, the whole Jay thing. You know, I thought that was the whole Jason Muse's portrayal of Jay in that movie was very surprising to me. And I thought it was very sweet. Um, so, yeah, I think that was just still in relation to Happy Gilmore. So, yeah, so that's uh, more details on the Joker 
quote-unquote musical, speaking of musical, Ryan Coogler is planning a Prince-themed jukebox musical. Jukebox musical. I love how... I love how whenever there's a new phrase that's penned in the industry, now everyone runs with it, right? How many times have you heard that term jukebox musical before until now? So a new report at the Inch Schneider indicates that Creed and Black Panther director Ryan Coogler is set to produce a jukebox musical based on the music of the late music icon Prince. Currently untitled, the project has been set up at Universal Pictures, which has the rights to a number of songs in Prince's catalog dating back to 2018. The goal has been to develop a film inspired by his music, but this will be an original story and won't be biography. But let me say that again. And won't be a biography. It won't be a biography type musical. There you go. As a report indicates, Prince's estate sees the 1984 film Purple Rain as having covered the artist's story. Jukebox musicals are... Okay, this gives me... Now this gives you the definition of what jukebox musical is. The project reportedly has a script from Brian Edward Hill and we'll see Coogler, Sev Ohanian, and Zinzi Coogler producing alongside Universal Music Publishing Group Chair Jody Gerson. Prince boasts many classics to his name. Of course, we all know When Doves Cry, Purple Rain, Little Red Corvette, Cream, Raspberry Beret, Let's Go Crazy, and Kiss. Coogler is gearing up to shoot his period vampire film with Michael B. Jordan next month ahead of a March 2025 release. I would love to see this go into Ready Player 2, into that scene in particular, into that chapter particularly that I like when you have uh, Percival, the main character, fighting against the army of Prince clones. I think that's the the great lead up into that. I would love to see that. So there you go. An interview with Michael J. Fox, he mentions he wants Marty to be female in a reboot. Is that real? Is that is it, was he being serious about that? I don't know. I don't think we're ever What was it? I was reading something over the weekend. And this is this is an interesting thing to know too. Um, the 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 guys behind Back to the Future. I think it's Bob Gale, and was it and Zemeckis? I think those are the two that are responsible for Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah, Robert Zemeckis. <clears throat> Hold on. You have Rob, yeah, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, who both also wrote Back to the Future. They have a current contract right now, signed by Universal and signed by themselves. And it states that no one is allowed to touch Back to the Future at all unless they greenlight it. So they can't do any sequels. They can't do any spinoffs, TV shows, anything. They are not. No one is ever allowed to do anything with Back to the Future unless these two have a say and they greenlight it. Can you imagine having that much control over such a popular franchise that you know Universal is chomping at the bit to do something with? You know the minute they could. Universal is dying to do another movie, is dying to do some sort of spinoff. But they can't because every time something crosses the table or gets presented or gets suggested, both Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis have been known to turn it down. So I, who knows what's going to happen? And I think it's one of those contracts that's like... Uh, living in perpetuity. So that means as long as one of them is still alive, the contract is still binding. So, and I know this is very dark. I, I know this is going to go into a very dark space. But imagine the moment both of them are now no longer with us. You know, Universal's like, let's go! Back to the future time, baby! Who's got the script? Let's go! Green light. Let's put it into production right now. Uh, 
So it is what it is. I mean, if 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 what you're saying is true that they want to plan a reboot, I don't know. I have I have not seen anyone report on that. I'm not saying you're lying, but it's kind of hard for me to believe that that's something they're thinking of doing right now. Unless Universal wants to do that now and Bob and Zemeckis are just like, nope, we're not letting you do that. So, but it, it, I don't think you have, I don't think anyone out there, I, I guess with the exception of George Lucas at the time, before he sold it off to Disney, that some like creators have such control over an IP like these guys have. I don't think there's anyone else in Hollywood right now currently that has that control over an IP that they created. So we'll see. Hey, if you're right, I'm going to call you out on it. I'm going to be like, you know what? This was all said by good old Star Lord Seven. Just right now, it's kind of hard for me for me to believe that this is gonna that's something that's gonna happen anytime soon unless like i said unless the moment that robert zemeckis and bob gale just wave goodbye to the universe then we'll see but i think as long as they are alive and breathing we are not going to see another back to the future anything right now And just so we know, oh, I'm not calling you a liar. I hope you know that. Uh, I'm not calling you a liar one bit. I'm just saying, like, I it's hard for me to believe right now because I've never read anything about it. If you want to share the interview, let me know, and I'll and I'll and I'll watch it. Right now, Robert Zemeckis is 71. And Bob Gale is 72. Oh, they're like right, they're like the same age, basically. So I'm sure both of them, and maybe I'm sure a lot of Back to the Future fans are hoping that they're extremely healthy. <laughs> and they're going to be living for quite a while. Because <laughs> I, I guarantee you, most, most people out there do not want to see anything done with Back to the Future, especially seeing how certain studios treat sequels and reboots and remakes right now. I'm sure a lot of people are are hoping that leave it alone. Don't touch this. Please don't. All right. So, Carry on here. Who who was a huge fan of Thundercats back in the day? Me. Me. I love Thundercats. There's just something about that story and those characters that I always found very fascinating. So much so that it surprises me that to this day we have not seen anything done with Thundercats. On, he on the He-Man side, we've seen many multiple attempts at bringing He-Man back. Most recently, you have Kevin Smith doing the Netflix He-Man shows, right? That are kind of a lot of mixed feelings and, and thoughts on that with the way they handle things. G.I. Joe, we've seen multiple attempts at it. Transformers, of course, we've seen so many things at it. But Thundercats... The only thing we ever saw was that they did like a, a remake or a reboot to the animated series on the Cartoon Network. And then we saw them do another attempt at an animated show, Thundercats Ho, I think it was, which was kind of like a Teen Titans Go kind of take on the Thundercats franchise. But nothing really more of a serious attempt to bring it into either movie form or something but adam wingard who is responsible for the american iterations of the godzilla movies godzilla kong movies is apparently working on thundercats for something 
So I'm b- back here on Dark Horizons with Godzilla X Kong, The New Empire, opening in cinemas next Friday. Filmmaker Adam Wingard has been out there promoting his project and was inevitably asked about what's next. Wingard's name is linked to a number of films, one of the most notable being a hybrid CGI feature adaptation of the iconic late 1980s Rankin-Bass animated series Thundercats. That show revolves around a group of humanoid cats who must flee their planet of Thundera after it's destroyed, crash landing on another planet, Third Earth, they must Thwart the evil sorcerer Mumra, Mumra, the ever-living, who is bent on killing them off. Speaking with comicbookmovie.com, Wingard was asked for an update on how that film is going, to which he says he and collaborator Simon Barrett are still penning the script. Simon and I are still actively working on the script. We finished our last draft basically right when I was going into production on The New Empire, and we just had to put everything on hold. Right now, we're actively working on it again. So whether that means that's the next thing I do or I'm not sure. But it's definitely one of the top priorities I have right now in terms of working on a script. It was previously reported that while the animated series served as a jumping off point, Wingard will take the property in a direction he has been thinking about for many years and will boast a hyper real look and somehow bridges a gap between cartoon and CGI. It will also retain the 1980s aesthetic. I kind of like the sound of that. The director also tells Discussing Film that he'd love to do a Godzilla vs. Kong trilogy capper. Ooh. Why did I just sound like George Takei? Ooh, bye. The whole idea that if you've done two movies, like maybe you should just go ahead and do a third because as you said, there's a trilogy in there. I definitely think that there's more to this and I think that I have more story to tell. It just depends on how it does and how things kind of shape out. I would be very excited to be able to come back on for another one if things worked out. Wingard's name has also remains attached to a remake of Face Off, an adaptation of Robert Kirkman's hardcore comic. Face Off. Wow. I don't think I need to see another Face Off movie. I think the face-off that we got with Nicolas Cage and Travolta is perfect for what it is. But Thundercats, let's see this happen because I would love to see Thundercats. And knowing what Adam Wingard can do with, you know, kind of like over-the-top CG type characters, I could kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of a little interested and would be excited to see the CGI hybrid of a movie that he has in his mind. And maybe it's just because I'm a sucker for 80s properties. And maybe, again, I, I'm a little biased because I love Thundercats. But I would just love, love to see a thunder, an attempt, at least, at a Thundercats movie. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But I always thought Thundercats could lend itself to uh, a good movie, if done right. Just like how I think... Legend of Zelda would make a good movie if done right. So we'll see. We shall see what happens. Start with Michael J. Fox on Back to the Future 4 in hopes for reboot exclusive. The channel is... Oh, Entertainment Tonight. Entertainment Tonight. Come and go and watch our show. Ba-ba-ba. I remember when entertain to, I remember when Entertainment Tonight was one of my favorite shows I used to love watching on TV because it was this was obviously pre-internet so it was the only source of news I got for any movie, TV, anything related to that. I used to love watching that show. I used to love when they did the birthday segments. It's like celebrating birthdays this week. And they would like run down whoever is like celebrating the birthday. Or today's birthdays are. And I, I remember, again, I'm, this is a younger Renee, right? So I used to have huge crushes on Lisa Gibbons, who was one of the hosts. And it was Lisa Gibbons and this other host that I had a crush on. And one of them, I'll never forget this. One of them was at an MTV party. 
uh, maybe during or after the music awards or one of the first iterations of their movie awards. And you know how MTV always showed like the, the after party clips and everything. And I could be wrong. But I remember they were interviewing. It's not Lisa Gibbons. It's hold on. Let me look up hosts for entertainment. Yeah, let's see. Uh, it's only giving me the current host. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Will this give me some of the older hosts? No. What the hell? Oh, Mary Hart. Right. Okay. It was Mary Hart, and then she would be in rotation with Lisa Gibbons. And then you have that guy who eventually also did music. I forget his name. But it was Lisa Gibbons. Yeah, Lisa Gibbons. Who was, for lack of a better way of saying, was very ample in the bosom area, right? So I remember it was like an after party. Uh, and MTV was hosting it. And they did like the after party clips. And they were interviewing Lisa Gibbons. And she was talking to them. And she was wearing, wearing a very low cut top. And during the interview, all of a sudden, you saw an olive land right in her cleavage. It was like, and she was like, oh, and then she started dying laughing. And the camera would pan over, and it was one of the Baldwins who did it. Who, like, who, <laughs> and it was like the funniest shit I've ever seen on TV. And it's MTV, so that type of, you know, behavior. It, it's kind of too, it's kind of expected, right? Because everyone's drinking, everyone's having a good time. And she was such a great sport about it. Yeah, I think it was, um, it's not Alec Baldwin, Stephen. I think it was Stephen Baldwin who did it. Again, I could be very wrong about it. And it should be a clip I should look up. You know, as a matter of fact, I'm going to look it up right now. I don't know if I'll find it. But I remember it was hilarious when I saw it. Uh, let's see. Lisa Gibbons. Olive. MTV. Uh, let's see. No, no. Or maybe I should. Lisa. No. Let's see. Lisa Gibbons. MTV interview. I don't think I'm going to find it. Yeah. It, it, this is going to be really, really hard to find. Because, you know, this was like early MTV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Starlight said, good luck finding it. Exactly. Like, unless someone was recording it at that moment... This this is gonna what did they say lost footage? This is definitely lost footage. I think. Oh man, I wish I had it because it was the funniest shit I've ever seen. It was really really funny. Music awards. Let's see. I'm just gonna do these type of searches and see if anything pops up. Yeah, it's not looking good. It's not looking good here. Let's see. MTV Movie Awards. Yeah. I, it's funny how I look this up and it, it gives me Lisa Gibbons wins Celebrity Apprentice Season 7. Thanks. Thanks, YouTube. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to find it. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll find it. And if I do, you know I'm going to talk about it because that is like the funniest moment I've seen on TV during that time. But anyways, let's wrap things up with two more bits of news here. One, let's go into the video game world and let's talk about Grand Theft Auto 6. I, when, I, this headline, when this was posted on Friday, I was not surprised one bit. I was like, I, I knew something like this was going to come out. And again, because I know 
kind of how Rockstar operates because I I had friends that used to work for them not not any longer. But I remember I know how the company operates. So there's a report going out there or a rumor going out there that Grand Theft Auto 6 could move to 2026. So according to this article, a new report from Kotaku indicates that internally within Rockstar, whilst the internal goal is to release Grand Theft Auto 6 in early 2025, the game could be pushed back all the way to 2026. Such a delay is being considered a fallback plan if the production hits problems, potentially referring to the number of high-profile leaks about the game. Uh, it gives a little bit of a background of what the game is going to be about. Rockstar released the first official trailer for the game in December, the clip racking up over 90 million views in just 24 hours. The plan has been for a PS5 and Xbox Series XS release in early 2025 with PC at a later date. Rockstar has faced internal backlash this year after they informed staff of plans to end its hybrid working policy for productivity and security reasons. The news comes as Reuters is reporting that the China set Assassin's Creed Jade is looking likely to be delayed from 2024 to a 2025 release. So, again, this is just speculation and rumor. But honestly, I won't be surprised if this actually comes into fruition. And I think it's going to benefit if this does happen, this will benefit Microsoft and Sony. Because if the rumors are true, and we are going to get a PlayStation 5 Pro sometime soon, we're going to get a Nintendo Switch 2 probably by next year. Right? And Microsoft more than likely will follow up with their next iteration of their consoles then this will only benefit them more because it gives them more of a reason to really work on those consoles so that it could handle a game as massive as Grand Theft Auto 6. Because the reports right now is that the, the, the leaked specs on the PlayStation 5 Pro, which confused the fuck out of me because of how it doesn't seem like a major leap from the current PlayStation 5 is that it probably will not be handle, be able to handle 60 frames per second for a game like Grand Theft Auto 6. And if you can't do that, then what's the point? I think, you know, right now, most gamers, they want high quality gaming with their consoles right now. And if you can't achieve anything higher than, than 30 frames per second, then you're way behind on the ball on that. Way behind. Yeah. So I don't... I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, I don't have this crystal ball in front of me that can predict what's going to happen with this game or with this current generation of gaming, which I think is kind of all over the place and has been now for this generation and last generation. I feel like we're kind of like in this weird all over the place mess where we're releasing hardware that is not really up to snuff 100% and then following up with version 2s or pros of said consoles that are only slightly better than the previous console. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. But Starlord, you said it. They love flying very close to the sun. And that's Rockstar. You know, they love doing that. They love putting their own foots in their own mouths. You know, they, 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 for the longest time, have been portraying themselves as such an elite publisher. Right? Because of their success for one game. Just one game. And one IP. Carrying them through all these years. I mean, how long ago did Grand Theft Auto V come out? I mean, granted, they have still tons and tons of people playing it. But when you have a company that's relying so much on this one property, they can't half-ass it. They can't. So if there even is a remote chance that the game is not going to do well at launch, I, I could foresee them pushing it a little bit. Because they also don't want to get the backlash that they got last time. And what was it when they released Grand Theft Auto 
was it on the Switch or was it on on mobile? And it was a hot mess and they got so much backlash on it. I forget which it was. I think it was on the Switch. You know, and it pissed off a lot of people that worked on that. Because in a way they were like thrown under the bus for it when it was really management's choice to release it that way. I don't know. I, I would love to say that maybe they've learned their lesson for that, but who's to say? We'll see. So I, I won't be surprised one bit if they tried to push that back a little bit. Just to make sure they have all their I's dotted and all their T's crossed. And who knows, maybe they can have the help from AI on that. <laughs> because OpenAI is currently having meetings with film studios. And that will be the final topic for this morning. OpenAI has meetings with film studios. Artificial intangible... Oh my gosh, what the hell was I saying? You blew it! <laughs> All right. Let's reel it back a little bit. Okay. Artificial intelligence startup OpenAI has reportedly scheduled meetings in Los Angeles next week, that means this week, with Hollywood studios, media executives, and talent agencies, reports Bloomberg. The aim of those meetings? To form partnerships in the entertainment industry and encourage filmmakers to integrate its new AI video generator into their work. The meetings are said to be the latest round of outreach from OpenAI in recent weeks and follows intro introductory conversations in Hollywood back in late February, led by the company's COO, Brad Lightcap. Lightcap demonstrated the capabilities of Sora, the still unreleased new service that can generate realistic looking videos up to about a minute in length based on text prompts from users. If you don't know what this is, do a, do a YouTube search or Google search about video and open AI. And when I first saw the footage of what was generated, I was kind of shocked. I was like, wow, we are already getting to this point. Oof. A series of high definition clips instantly captured the attention of not just Hollywood and Silicon Valley, but the world media. Though not public yet, OpenAI has already granted a few big-name actors and directors access to Sora, a spokesperson for OpenAI said in a statement. OpenAI has a deliberate strategy of working in collaboration with industry through a process of iterative deployment, rolling out AI advances in phases, in order to ensure safe implementation and to give people an idea of what's on the horizon. We look forward to an ongoing dialogue with artists and creatives. Screenwriters and actors, of course, went on strike last year, partly to speak or sorry, partly to seek protections with the use of the technology. Both unions secured some safeguards for how AI is used in the entertainment industry. The runaway text to video service is already being used by professionals at production and animation studios who rely on the tech for previs and storyboarding. OpenAI SOAR is still in the research preview stage, the company said, and no pricing has yet been set. So what does this all mean? You're going to hear more and more discourse about the use of AI, especially now that it could do video. Now, the early videos that you see it being produced are more like landscape footage, city views, a lot of like gen broad generic stuff, right? So if you type in, I want to see a nighttime, I want to produce nighttime video of Tokyo, of streets in Tokyo, blah, blah, blah. And it will produce this video of like someone walking through the streets of Tokyo at night. And I'm sure it's gathering up all the videos that they see probably on YouTube, Venmo, uh, Vim what is it, Vimeo. Venmo, <laughs> Twitter, all that stuff, Instagram, and they're just putting it all together, right? But what you see is really fantastic. It's like, wow, this looks amazing. Or if you type in a uh, drone view of Chicago, 
And I'm sure it's going to grab all whatever it can find and put it together and spit it out for you. Now, it can only do up to a minute. So, I don't think you could, you'll could. you see someone working at a major studio prompting, 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 and taking all of these minute clips and putting a movie together. Highly unlikely. But if we're seeing the technology doing things like this now, give it another couple of years and let's see what it does. And that's when it can get really scary. You know, my concern is having YouTubers ha grant, uh, granted access to this stuff. Because the amount of fake videos you're going to start getting once that's more readily available is going to be frightening to see. And personally, as someone who creates on YouTube, I don't want to see any of that. That's just me. But we're getting there. There's no stopping this crazy AI train. I get a lot of people are going to get really pissed off about it. It is what it is. But the technology is here. All we have to do is learn to work with it, work around it, safeguard it, safeguard the creatives that it may affect, and move on from there. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But it is getting very scary on how advanced this thing is. It's fascinating how it is. You know, and I've dabbled in AI. I've done images. I've done prompts for uh, video titles, descriptions, even like scripts. I've done like outlines to help out with things I work on. And I've seen how it works. It's crazy. I mean, I've been dabbling with it now for what? Almost two years? When my friend put me up on it? And we are still considered to be early in all of this. You know, like I said, give it another couple of years. It's going to be extremely scary and frightening what it could do. And that's why I understand and side with the writers and, you know, the actors and actresses about the use of AI. I was speaking about Roadhouse and the amazing, the huge amounts of use of CG and video editing, like digital video editing. That I won't be surprised if there was some AI used in that movie. With some of like the background people, I won't be surprised. Because you could see just how free they were in using digital video editing, digital composites, digital effects for just two guys fighting in front of you. It's nuts. So to see what they can do with video now, oh my God. Oof. Lord have mercy. Uh, Starlord, when they push to 2026, we will say, why can't we play? <laughs> why can't we play it, dickless? <laughs> AKB Mobile in the house. <laughs> MKBHD did an interesting video essay a month or three ago about video AI a year or two ago versus video AI now. in night and day. What's crazy is this is only... Oh, yeah, I know. Believe me, I know. It is nuts. Like I said, as someone who dabbles in with AI, it, it's crazy. It's crazy the amount of response I get now versus what I got last year. And the difference. Especially with the imagery. I remember a year ago, and I fooled around with this concept. And by the way, Starlord said, I'm using AI tools. Now, all right, I remember we had a conversation about that. I have AI imagery for logos, and I'm using Unmix to separate vocals from music. I use that too. I use that. I did a trailer reaction to the Onimusha anime series on Netflix. And it kept getting flagged because of the music in it. Not the video, not the dialogue, but the music, because it was copyright music. So what did I do? I used that, pro that program to change the music and remove like some of the bass beats, some of the, the guitar images. And I would just leave in hints of the lyrics in there of the guys, the guy actually singing. And I got passed through the copyright. 
because I was able to separate a lot of the, the channels of the music from it. I also use a lot of AI when it comes to photo editing and video editing. Because whether you like it or not, or whether you're aware of it or not, AI is in your programs already. It have been for a long time. When you take a photo with your cell phone, and you know how it touches it up, or how it like blurs like the background, or how it knows how to enhance certain things, that's all AI there. But I remember when I first dabbled in AI, especially the imagery, the imagery portion of it, I did this series. I, I, I've never I've never posted it anywhere. And I thought it would be like a funny thing to do for like a shirt brand or something. And it's like it's superheroes eating pizza. And I would type in prompts of like Spider-Man eating pizza, Batman eating pizza, Superman eating pizza. And the images I got back were hilarious. But it looked pretty decent. You know? I was like, oh, it looks kind of like avant-garde. It looks very like, like someone was uh, doing water brush painting of like a Spider-Man eating pizza. And I thought it would be like a funny series to do. A couple months ago, I did it now just to see how it looks. Forget it. Night and day. And this is just a year. So my whole idea, and none of y'all better to steal it, because I swear, I have it on video that this was my idea, my creation. So don't you dare take it from me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But if I were to move forward with that idea now, it's going to look 20 times better than it did last year. And I'm sure if I give it another year, it's going to look even better than that. So it's going to be insane. The advances in this whole AI thing is is crazy. And I can only imagine how it's going to look like in a couple of years from now, especially like on the video side of things. Oh, nuts. Insane. But like I said before, AI is here. It's not going anywhere. If anything, it's getting more and more advanced. So all you can do is learn it, learn to work with it, learn to work around it, you know, and learn how to put safeguards in it for the creative people that may be affected by it. That's all. And if you are a creative person who draws, paints, edits, it will be in your best interest to at least learn more about AI because it will assist you with whatever you're working on. And God forbid you get to a point where they're like, well, AI can do this. So why do we need you? If you can at least say, but I know how to use AI. It's just adding more tools to your tool set, which is something that I've taught people all the time when it comes to working. I've been a manager for years, 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 years. And the one thing I've always taught people in my team is that learn as much as you can now so that wherever you go after this, you're going to be even better than the person working there. Make yourself like the Swiss army knife of whatever you're doing. And that's the best advice I could give anybody and will continue to give everybody. Learn what you can, even if it's not directly involved in what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. If you have that opportunity to learn it, learn it. Because that's only going to benefit you more in the long run. You make yourself more valuable as a piece within a company structure. And eventually, if you decide to do things on your own, go freelance or do your own job, I mean, do your own company or whatever, work on your own brand. At least you have all the tool sets within you to accomplish those things on your own and not feel lost and not feel like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. You got to keep, keep the knowledge flowing. Keep, keep your, keep, keep yourself in the know of whatever is going on. And boom, exactly what AKB Mobile said. 
If you have the opportunity to do it on a company's dime, take advantage of it. You don't know how many times I've been in a company where they would offer to pay for classes for further education or advancements in your skill sets. And how many times no one, like people I've worked with, do not take advantage of that. And they always have excuses. I have no time, blah, 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 this and that. Make the time, find the time. Because I'm sure there are more companies nowadays that don't offer that anymore. But if they do, why not? Do it. And believe me, I am of two sides of the fence when it comes to AI. I understand the plights of the creative people out there. I totally do. But I can also see the benefits of what AI can do and how it could assist those creatives in further doing their jobs. Not 100% replacing them. We're nowhere near that. And I don't know if we'll ever get to that because I always do feel like there's a human element that needs to be involved when it comes to anything creative. But if you are a creative and you know how to use AI along with all your regular tool sets, you got to you gotta learn it. You got to learn it, whether you like it or not. Because it ain't going anywhere. And if anything, it's getting more and more advanced. By the month, it's getting more and more advanced. It's crazy how more and more advanced it is. And I can have people watching this later and be like, why are you speaking so highly about AI? How dare you? And all that. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just keeping it real. I didn't create AI. I'm not putting it out there. But I know it's there. You know? And I'm not bowing to it. I'm not, you know, submissing myself to it. You know, it's not like it's not like the Terminator where we have to like be captives of AI. Where it's just not the Matrix where we're like the slaves of the machines. But God help me, I'm gonna learn how to work with it. <laughs> so that if we get to that point, I'm gonna say, hey. I'm one of you guys. <laughs> I know how you guys work. Believe me, I know what it means. I'll be an asset. <laughs> I'll be an asset. I'll be I'll be the first to admit that. I was like, oh no, don't don't do don't slave me. I know. Hey, you need help with this? I know how it works. I'll be right there in the front lines with y'all. <laughs> So art is subjective anyways. There are many types. True. But but also, you, ha you have to also understand, when you think of AI, it is grabbing samples of existing things out there. It's not at that point where it's freshly creating things from scratch. So I do understand that concept. Now, it's very broad when you think about that. So you don't know exactly where it's getting its ideas from. So that's the one side of AI that I do have to, un that you do kind of have to acknowledge. And that's why you have to kind of understand from a creative standpoint how that could be very daunting and concerning. It could be the genies out of the bottle. Creatives not learning. It will be at the whim of creatives that do know even a little bit. Another, yeah, exactly. 1,000%. One, 1, yeah. 1,000%. Yeah. Unfortunately, what's going to happen is that you're going to have the old school creatives that are very stubborn to adapt or learn it that you're going to get the young person fresh out of college or maybe not even yet in a college level that knows so much about working with AI that that person could eventually get replaced by that person. We already seen it in, in multiple things. We've already seen it happen in, in, in things that, you know, in any industry. So it is what it is. By the way, you'll see that AKB Mobile has this, what is that, Teal? A Teal Star now? Indicating that he's officially two months member. So thank you for that, AKB. I got to update those icons. 
Can I I gotta make it more personable to the channel. More personable. I'm just trying to think like what would it be? You know? I don't know. I have to I have to figure out a theme. A theme around it all. Star Lord background room. Oh my gosh, through Photoshop, the amount of time I use it for background removal. Oh man, lifesaver for me. Or the what you might call it? The subject highlighting. Huge lifesaver. Especially since I have to create thumbnails like almost on a daily basis. Unbelievable. One month, one ticket. One month, one ticket? What do you mean? One month member. You're currently on the second month. Two months, two tickets. Three per... Oh! Icons! Yes! Two months, two tickets. Three months... Oh, shit! That's actually a brilliant idea. Oh, I like that idea. And then if it's like... A year or something like that, make it a combo, popcorn and a, dr and a drink or something. I like that idea. <laughs> oh, not laughing. What the hell? I love that idea. Oh, yes. Thank you. Major thank yous for that one. That is a brilliant idea. I didn't even think of that. Sometimes it's just good to ask the audience. It's good to ask you guys. Because I'm so in it sometimes that it's hard for me to think outside the box. And I'm glad that I can like, ask all of you thoughts and opinions about certain things like that. Especially if you're, if you're, if you're working in building a community. I, I think the one thing that the, the creative people that I admire the most is those that work very closely with the community and not try to dictate the community, if that makes any sense. Because you see those types out there, right? So I like that. I like that. I'm actually going to type that down right now because I, I don't want to forget that. That is brilliant. I love it. Take it. Popcorn. For badges. Yeah. I love it. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, kind gentlemen. <laughs> Why do I keep eating the laugh one? Stop it. You blew it! All right, y'all. It is... 12.40, and I think I am going to call it for the morning. Oh, wait. AKB, one to four months. One to four ticks. Five months. Six months soda. Seven months. Reese's Pieces. Yeah, you, it has to get it has to get to the point where it's like a combo, right? So you have the drink, the popcorn, the candy, maybe nachos in there, pretzel bites. <laughs> maybe work your way up to like a burger meal. Or something. I, I have to put myself in the mindset of a movie theater. And how uh, the grandest combo you can get. Right? And then work with that. Or make it colored. Right? Well, the first combo is a regular combo. Two years is like the golden combo. So it's old and gold. You know, something like that. Multi-combo. Combo for two. Like a, like a two-o. Like a duo. Right? <laughs> I like that. I like these ideas. Now I just have to figure out how to, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll just have to pay an artist for it to work on it. Oh, let's see if AI can do it. <laughs> I'll see if AI can come up with it. All right, y'all. I think I'm going to call it for the morning. Thank you so, so much. For tuning in as always. Big shout outs again to Star Lord, AKB Mobile, especially AKB with a fantastic idea for the badges for the channel. I gotta get on get to work on that because I love that idea. I really, really do. I gotta get to work on the the tiers too. 
and I work on that and promote it. But thank you so much. Hope all of you enjoy your Mondays. If you're watching this on the replay, I hope you have a fantastic Monday and a fantastic week to start things off. Thank you for watching. If you haven't done so yet, don't forget, hit that like. If you hated all this or you hate watched me for some reason, you could dislike this as well. And if you haven't done so yet, subscribe. But I'm pretty sure that you have already subscribed if you're watching this. But I appreciate all the support as always. I will be back here again on Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So with all that out of the way, stay cool, stay classy, stay safe. I will catch you all in the next time. Peace out, everybody. Bye-bye. As the train goes by, choo-choo!